Good morning. Welcome to the third of the Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian webinars that are being offered as a series to provide you this educational opportunity during the stay at home order here in Ohio and also extending into other states. Um, this is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I'm so pleased to have with me my colleague Ray Brushart, who is going to be your presenter on the webinar today. A couple of quick housekeeping items, and then I'll turn things over to Ray. Um, first off, in the handouts box, we do have a copy of the slides for today, and you are welcome to download those from there. I'll also be sending them out as a follow-up after the webinar. Um, in that box as well, we have information about the entire series, including a link to register for the fourth webinar, which will be next Tuesday. Um, that fourth webinar is going to include portion of the presentation um, from Caitlin Harley, who is one of our ped bike coordinators in Ohio. And she is going to talk to you about the ways that Ohio is moving forward with the different countermeasures that are being discussed during this STEP course. So definitely look forward to that. And, and please understand today, um, Ray is probably not going to ask quite as many response questions for the question box um, because he does want to get through the information and make certain you have it before um, he turns things over to Kate on Tuesday. With that said, there is a question box and we would ask that you please use that question box to ask anything that comes up during the webinar. We're not going to be um, looking for raised hands. We just want to you know, limit it to the question box and to make sure everybody can find it. If you guys could please drop me a hi or hello. I see somebody already did that. So I appreciate that very much. Um, also, I, I failed to mention, but in the handout section, I've included for you a couple of additional flyers for other webinar series we have coming up in case you're interested. We have one on um, reducing rural roadway departures, the forward webinar series. And then we also have a webinar series we've put together in conjunction with the North Carolina LTAP Center on roadway drainage. Um, we've unfortunately had to cancel our in-person instructor-led training for later in May concerning roadway drainage. So we were fortunate enough to be able to partner with North Carolina LTAP and their excellent instructor down there to do a, a webinar series. So with that, thank you to everybody who said hello or good morning or hi in the question box already. And Ray, I believe it is all yours now. Take it away. All right, thank you, Victoria. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ray Brushhart. And uh, today we're in our session number three for our STEP webinar. Um, Let's see where we left off last time. We left off here at, um, <clears throat> we actually ended up with uh, session two with uh, looking, we finished up our crosswalk visibility enhancements with uh, with uh, ways to have lighting at our crosswalks. And so today we're gonna begin with raised crosswalks as our next countermeasure that's listed in our spectacular seven and uh, remind everybody that uh, each one of our countermeasures has its own text sheet on the everyday counts step website so you can uh, check that out for for more specific information um, I probably don't I can't probably tell you everything about raised crosswalks in a short period of time but the way it is with all of our countermeasures we uh, give you some links uh, so that you can uh, find other places to do more research. So let's uh, move on with the race crosswalks. Race crosswalks aren't appropriate for every location, uh, but they are appropriate for roadways that have two or three lanes and speed limits for up to 30 miles per hour or less and uh, an average annual daily traffic of below 9,000. And so um, here we have a, a picture of one. Um, in the NCHRP 674, they have a, a guidance called Crossing Solutions at Roundabouts and Channelized Turn Lanes for Pedestrians with Vision Disabilities. And um, NCHRP is the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. 
And uh, in this uh, booklet, they uh, showed positive results in slowing vehicles and yielding to pedestrians with this particular countermeasure. So here's some uh, bullet points here that show some considerations for raised crosswalks. <clears throat> they may not be appropriate if the street is a, a bus route or an emergency route. And you need to consult with emergency services. Uh, make sure that uh, there are fire trucks and things like that can get over these. Um, talk to your public service agency uh, or uh, public works about their snow plowing. Uh, see if they're able to deal with these as well. And as far as the ADA, it shows truncated domes for visually impaired. Drainage is always a consideration. So, you know, each location you need to uh, uh, make sure you have some drainage uh, input from the experts. And um, this treatment may be inappropriate for crossings on curves or steep roadway grades and several raised crossings in succession may be disrupted. Um, so these are some considerations there. And uh, of course, raised crosswalks are <clears throat> used a lot of times for traffic calming. I know I saw my first raised crosswalks in my own neighborhood when I lived in Dublin. Uh, there was a, an elementary school in my neighborhood and a big collector street. And so they actually built two raised crosswalks uh, in those areas and even in some neighboring subdivisions as well. But here's a link uh, from FHWA Office of Safety about traffic calming and speed management. See some pictures there, how it's raised and how it levels off across the top. So here's uh, some specs of a raised crosswalk from the MUTCD. Um, so I guess uh, the main point of this is that you know that there are MUTCD standards on uh, the pavement markings for a crosswalk and they need to be followed. You can see the, the V-shaped um, pavement markings. You know, these can be called speed tables. They can be called speed humps or raised crosswalks. They were called speed tables in my neighborhood. And there's a, a link at the bottom of the screen for more information to the to get you to the MUTCD. So here's a a graphic of a race crosswalk and you can see that um, when you build a race crosswalk it's uh, usually in conjunction with other um, treatments from our that we've gone over in our crosswalk visibility enhancements. So you can see here we've got the uh, high visibility crosswalk markings and uh, in-street pedestrian crossing sign and the advanced warning sign and overhead lighting as part of this particular project. Let's uh, check out a video with uh, race crosswalks.
All right. We're back. Let's get back to my PowerPoint here. Can you hear me, Victoria? Oh. Can you hear me, Victoria? I sure can, and I'm pretty sure okay. everybody else can too. That's All good. Right. Okay, so that was a nice video, don't you agree? Let's uh, move on to our next treatment, and that is a pedestrian refuge island. And again, there's our text sheet in the lower right that can be found on the Everyday Counts Step website. You can see how it shows uh, some statistics and other information on it. And here's a, a nice picture of our pedestrian refuge island. And um, you know it's easiest to install a pedestrian refuge island where there is a two-way left turn lane. Also, once again, the step treatment can be used in combination with other treatments that we've seen. As you can see, we've got our high visibility crosswalk markings and in-street pedestrian crossing sign, warning signs, curb extension, and overhead lighting in this particular treatment. Pedestrian refuge islands make it safer for pedestrians since they break up complex crossings into two simpler crossings. Has anybody in class been in or seen someone in the situation in this picture? I think we all have. Um, so trying to find a gap in both directions can be challenging and oftentimes deadly as we look at our statistics. And so here's a, a treatment for that location. You, you can see the pedestrian refuge island in the middle. And zooming in at the bottom, you see the in-street signage and other payment marking and signage treatments there. So here's some uh, some specifications and also a resource booklet up there in the top right. You see your guide for the planning, design, and operation of pedestrian facilities. And this is from AASHTO. And it's also referred to as the pedestrian green book. And so it gets into uh, the specifications like the minimum width of six feet wide and then we need wider than that if we're going to accommodate bicyclists, wheelchairs, scooters, and groups of pedestrians. And the length uh, it needs to be parallel to the street, a 20-foot minimum. So here's a, a graphic showing that um, things like detectable warning strips, in this particular one, since it's less than six feet, there are no detectable warning strips. A pedestrian refuge island less than six feet is not wide enough for a pedestrian to use the median as a refuge with any degree of comfort and does not accommodate more than a few pedestrians. No detectable warning strip is used in this median because truncated domes need to be two feet wide with a two feet gap in between truncated domes. <clears throat> So here's a particular one that's less than six feet wide. It has no truncated domes. Let's see what we got here. So here we have the, the no. So um, the picture in the lower left is show, shows the wrong application of truncated domes. The other two pictures show the right application of truncated domes. Let's go back to that. Uh, so the lower left application tells a visually impaired person that they have finished crossing all legs of the roadway, but in fact, they have not. So that's important to know, right? Medians between six and 16 feet wide. So again, we need a minimum of six feet wide median to put in truncated domes. So here we see the pathway and waiting area should be at street grade, 
two feet wide detectable warning strips on each end and a two foot wide clear zone minimum in the center. This particular graphic is from the San Francisco Better Streets Guide. All right, let's take a look at this one. It's got an angled cut through. Is this right or wrong? Can you see this? Uh, you can see it from above here. And then over here, it's angled. Here's an angle down this way, a slight angle here. So the key point with this slide is that um, we need to think about the blind when designing the cut through of the median, visually impaired, should use the raised curb edge to line up a visually impaired pedestrian with the crosswalk direction. And then there's an advisory on this, advisory R305.2.4 for pedestrian refuge islands that says the edges of cut through pedestrian refuge islands can provide useful cues to the direction of the crossing. The language about directional cues is just advisory and doesn't include any specifications. If we take a look at the upper right picture, it does not have, oh, this one, it does not have a redirect of the crosswalk. Um, it says Google Street View stitching software, not as good as it could be. Ray, there's a couple comments that have come into the question box. Um, okay. One of them said good should be angled toward oncoming traffic. And then another comment had, was regarding um, ADA compliance, that they felt it was not ADA compliant. Right. And they're correct. So, again, it sounds like we're waiting for the next MUTCD to give us better guidance. So I, I think we all can say that the the next edition of the MUTCD can't get here quick enough. You know, it's never taken this long before, but you know, there's a whole lot more research going into this one than ever before. A lot more changes than ever before. Let's see how landscaping can be used here. So landscaping can be a positive feature with this treatment. Um, but we got to make sure that uh, it does not block the sight lines of pedestrians and motorists at the crossing area. And a good idea would be to use ground covering, low shrubs, colorful native plants. And you know, we don't want anything that's going to be that would cause a roadside hazard. Let's take a look at this one here, some landscape treatments. So we see landscape treatments, then we see patterned concrete or paver service surface that may be used on the splitter islands in lieu of landscaping. So as you can see, it's got landscaping up to a certain point on this splitter island, and then it uses pavers. And we note that the sidewalk has low vegetation to discourage crossing at locations other than the crosswalks. So over here, they've utilized landscaping to make sure the pedestrians come up here to the actual crossing. It's a good idea. Hey, Ray, one question that came in, the minimum six foot, is that measured between painted edge lines or between curb faces? That's a good question. Um, I would and say paint and edge lines. But we can always follow up with a response that, to that, an, uh, an official answer to that question. See, I can uh, they probably go into more detail on that. Um, you know, the, the San Francisco Better Streets guy got their information from So we get back to this slide here. You know, the if we, if we took a look at the Ashto Green Book, pedestrian Green Book, that is where you would um, find the answer to that question.
And again, that's probably not a standard either, but guidance. Okay, let's look at a specific treatment that was done. Here we are in Tennessee, uh, where they needed to do something quickly, but due to concerns of delay to traffic during the holiday season, they put in a modular median. And uh, this installation was put in in one day, and the entire project came in under $30,000. Let's see if we can watch this. I'll try to get the sound to you. It's different than the other videos. Whoops. What happened? It's going to start the same as the other videos, but it has different follow up information, right? reports and studies and so we really are now focusing on urgency and getting people to act immediately we can't keep waiting one two three four more years to have something change because we know people are getting hit and injured every year right at this exact location we members were able to tell us what they wanted and out of that we really saw that the community members wanted a safer area to live in especially this area that's uh, really unsafe and has one of the biggest amount of pedestrian fatalities um, on Ulta Pike. I'm really passionate about this community of South Nashville and Ulta Pike is the heart of this area. It's a major corridor, uh, not just for South Nashville, but for the city in general. So I'm frustrated with the fact that it's everything's moving so slowly. Again, every time I drive down the street, I see people, my constituency people crossing the street. These are a lot of people that are catching the bus, that are walking. And so it's unfair that we have to wait so long for action to occur here. Uh, and we continue to put people in jeopardy. Okay, I hope, uh, I don't know if you could hear that very good, but at least you could see it. We could hear it. Okay, good. <clears throat> so here's some, some pictures there, I guess in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And at the bottom of the slide um, is a link to uh, this and other case studies. There's also a case study I want you to look at that happened in Phoenix. And so um, so here we are in Phoenix, and uh, it shows this street, West Van Buren Street. And um, it's pointing to a community center in the middle of your picture. And it's got half mile signal spacing and the street has high volume, high speed, and it has marked crosswalks at unsignalized intersections. So we see a ladder style crossing here and a ladder style crossing here at this offset intersection. So the this uh, community center, this entire area is a disadvantaged area and a lot of the kids live across the street from the community center. And so this ladder style crosswalk here, um, this was later removed and instead we have a mid block crossing improvement that we wanna show you. 
So this is the before picture. It says a no frills marked crosswalk at this intersection. And as we saw, this is actually an offset intersection. So if I go back, it's this one right here. So here's this uh, community center. It doesn't look all that super fabulous, does it? Um, may not look very appealing on the outside, but it was an oasis for the kids. And the inside was much nicer, at least that's what we were told. But the more important aspect is the number of crossing lanes here. So we have three lanes westbound, two lanes eastbound with a two-way left turn lane. So let's count that up, that's six lanes of traffic. <clears throat> and so here's our, our after picture. So we see a marked crosswalk move to the mid-block location. So here we are with this mid-block treatment. As you can see, it's an offset deal. So it's a raised median. They call that a stagger. And it has advanced stop lines as well, right here and here. So here's our street view of the improvement. <clears throat> so it's got the raised median with a stagger, advanced stop lines, and even an RRFB. So it's even got the fencing here. So here we see the, the RRFB, as you can see, it's solar powered. So it lights this up, flashes. Um, and down here we see the stop bars, the bottom on the, bo the bottom picture. So that was in Phoenix. So another treatment is a continuous raised median <clears throat> that breaks complex crossing into simpler crossings. And uh, I also teach an access management class and we love to build these for access management as well because it makes all the, the driveways along the street, uh, makes them right in, right out, which is safer for drivers. <clears throat> and of course it, it provides a, sh a shelter uh, refuge for the pedestrians as well. <clears throat> Let's take Ray, a look at here's yes. a question. They want to know is okay. the fence an obstacle for vehicles? It sounds like uh, it would be, doesn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I've, uh, that's definitely a barrier. But look what you know what they've done is they've got lighting. They've got two really good reflectors. They've got the uh, warning sign for them to stay to the right, uh, overhead lighting. So, <clears throat> you know, that's what they've done. Of course, this lane here, you know, it's already a, a two-way left turn lane all the way down through there with the double yellow lines. So, apparently it's, it's an okay treatment that as long as you have all this, uh, all these traffic control devices in with it. So this is what, <clears throat> let's look at Washington State DOT has done here. So we see in the middle of the street here, it's another offset or diagonal uh, treatment there for the for the pedestrians. If we click on this, we got our some more information on this. Some DOT standard drawings from Washington State. 
and it talks about how this is a more effective option than convention, conventional traffic curb medians. When access across is less than desirable, the raised median can be either paved or used as a planning area. So the standard drawings for this barrier can be found at this link at the bottom of the screen, Washington State DOT Design Standards Plan Sheet. So there's a link to it so you can see more detail. So that was our refuge, pedestrian refuge island treatment. Now, since I mentioned the RRFB in that one, I guess we need to talk about it next. So, a little bit more about the RRFB. I guess we could say it's back. So, remember I was talking about the Spectacular Sevens and how we can go with a superhero theme. This is the one that uh, was killed off but came back to life. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the, the crash reduction factor is 47%. Uh, a little bit about how it died is um, a lawsuit was filed by the inventor of the RRFB due to patent infringement. Certain types of patents are allowed. Behind the scenes functionality like signals, programming, but patents like the one filed for the RRFB only allow for a sole proprietorship and are not allowed. So FHWA had to pull the interim approval. Fortunately, a company bought out the patent and then opened it so anyone could use it. So that's how it came back to life. All right, so... <clears throat> Got some bullet points here about the rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So in order to get uh, one for your own project, you must request and receive permission to use this new interim approval, 1A-21, even if prior approval had been given for interim approval, 1A-11. And a state may request interim approval for all jurisdictions in that state. So here's the copy of the top part of the memorandum involved with this and over here is the an example over here of the RRFB it's dark in here and illuminated during the flashing here and it's mounted with the W11-2 sign and W16-7P plaque and an uncontrolled marked crosswalk <clears throat> I think it's time for another video so let's check out another video here. This one has good audio, I promise. Let's see. What? Oh, this is the one I don't have, sorry. <laughs> I thought I had that one in there. Okay, so under the interim approval, let's talk about the allowable uses. So this functions as pedestrian actuated conspicuity enhancement. <clears throat> and um, it's not a signal, it's a beacon, which is a pedestrian actuated conspicuity enhancement and it shall only be used to supplement post-mounted pedestrian uh, crossing school zones trail crossing warning sign with diagonal downward arrow plaque or overhead mounted warning sign located at or immediately adjacent to an uncontrolled marked crosswalk and if deemed necessary by the engineer in event of sight distance additional rrfbs may be installed in advance of the crosswalk shall supplement, not replace. So uh, for the additional R RFB in advance of the crosswalk, it's not necessary to have on both sides of the roadway, as will be brought up on the next slide. <clears throat> so here we have a picture of a RRFB. And um, this is down in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
and the memorandum 1A-21 says for any approach to our RFBs required, one on the right hand side and one on the left hand side of the roadway and if divided, if it's a divided highway, left hand should be installed on the median if practical rather than far left hand. So here's a how it looks as it's flashing. We'll take we'll consider this to be our video. So that is our flashing pattern. So here's some more info from our memorandum 1A-21 for beacon operation. Um, it says the flash period shall be immediately initiated each and every time a pedestrian is detected through passive detection or push button activated, including when pedestrians are detected while the RRFBs are already flashing and when pedestrians are detected immediate, immediately after the RRFBs have ceased flashing. The small pilot light may be installed. So down here in the bottom right, it shows us a view of the pilot light to pedestrian at shared use path crossing with median refuge. And there's an enlargement here of the pilot light right here. And in part seven goes on to say that uh, if a speech push button information message is used, locator tone shall be provided and if speech push button information message is used the audible information device shall not be shall not use vibro tactile indications or percussive indications and speech push push button message yellow lights are flashing message should be spoken twice and um, you're probably wondering why it uses if at the top so it says if one might if one might ask the question how do you not discriminate against the disabled without an APS even though the um, there's some guidelines called pro wag which stands for public right-of-way accessibility guidelines even though that is not formally adopted the ADA says you can't discriminate against the disabled. So, if you, in case you were thinking that. Again, it sounds like there's, there's different organizations that need to clear these things up and get on the same page and put out some, some new standards even, instead of just guidelines. So here's a, another one here. Our RRFBs have been proving to be very effective and is growing in popularity across the country. And the cost per each one of these crosswalks is around $7,000. One area of caution is installing them on higher speed, 40 miles per hour and above, and multi-lane roads, which is greater than four lanes. We're still learning what the upper end limits are for this treatment. So we had uh, we've had three studies examine pedestrians crossing two four-lane roads and one three-lane roads with median islands. When pedestrians stepped into the crosswalk before installation of the rapid flash LED beacons, the average yield rate of motorists was 19%. That doesn't sound very high, does it? When two rapid flash LED beacons were added, one on each side of the street, the yield rate increased to an average of 81%. So that's a lot better, right? When another set of rapid flash LED beacons were added to the medians, the average yield rate jumped to 88%, even better. Further research is showing yielding rates averaging 90% with some as high as 97%. And then it goes on to say the motorist yield you also yielded further back from the crosswalks with two rapid flash LED beacons and even more yielded with four. So this study was done down in St. Petersburg. 
Florida back in 2008. So they've been around for quite a while. So that was our RRFBs. So now let's move on to our PHB, Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon. So the PHB is a, it's the next level up from the RRFB. And uh, the PHB has a crash reduction factor of 55%. And the costs have been coming down. When they first started being constructed, we were getting quotes from between $80,000 to $150,000, which is kind of similar to traffic signal installations. However, recently a vendor designed a compact controller and made it solar. And that has dropped the prices significantly. And if you don't count the polls, then the latest quotes we have are around $20,000. So it's a lot less. So again, down here on the right side of the screen, we see a text sheet from the EDC STEP website for further information on this treatment. So once again, as you may have guessed, when you install one of these RRFBs, and we're going to use it with some of the other step treatments that we've already talked about. We have our high visibility crosswalk markings, advanced stop line, warning sign back here at the stop stop, stop uh, line and the overhead lighting. When to consider a PHB. So um, the PHB falls in between the RRFB and a traffic signal but more towards a traffic signal application. So we consider these when uh, the pedestrians want or need to cross the high-speed multi-lane roadways. So that's, you know, we're talking with high-speed multi-lane roadways here. Crossing location does not meet signal warrants. Crosswalk markings and signs just won't do, if there are any at all. And pedestrians complain or we have the crash data that shows a problem. I know uh, I lived in Dublin. They installed one of these on uh, Hayden Run Road, uh, just to the east of Riverside Drive. It's for a, a big fancy gym that had a small parking lot and a bigger parking lot across Hayden Run, which was five lanes wide. And um, it was a big problem getting people across that street to the parking lot. And there were apartments over there too. So, but that was the first time I saw one of these. These are also called a hawk. And I really do have a video for this one. So let's check it out.
Hey, Ray, don't forget it muted you when you started the video. Okay, I'm good now, right? Yes, you should be. And Scott, who said they've got nothing on their screen or no sound, I apologize. Um, hopefully, whatever has happened there um, will get resolved. So you might want to try going out and coming back in if you're hearing this. Thanks. Did you see it, Victoria? Oh, yeah, it worked great for me. Okay. Uh, and other people are saying they saw it, too. So. Okay, good. I spent a lot of time making that video. <laughs> Ray. Okay, maybe I didn't. But somebody did. Okay, so anyway. So this is where we consider installing a PHB. PHB. Again, it's high-speed multi-lane roadways. And the crossing location does not meet signal warrants. Okay, I think I already read that. So, there was another video there. Um, okay, so this goes over the the different screens or the, the you know the different modes for what what is seen by the motorist, but also what is seen by the pedestrian. And so. You know, up here at the top, if it's blank, then the driver just needs to proceed. And then after the pedestrian hits the button, that's when it starts flashing yellow to, to begin warning the motorists. And then the next phase is a steady yellow, so that tells the motorist that it's about to turn red. And then comes the steady red. And then over here, the pedestrian uh, crossing switches to the, the, the OK to walk symbol. And then after whatever the, the time is, either it's 14 seconds or, or maybe more or maybe less, depending on the number of lanes, you get your the wig-wag phase, which is the alternating flashing red. So then at this point, it's actually okay for the motorist pr to proceed if, and only if, there's no pedestrians in the crosswalk. And then, of course, when it goes blank, then that's when the, the motorist can still proceed. But, of course, they might want to check just to make sure there's no pedestrians in the crosswalk trying to run across at the last second. So that's what is is meant for these. Um, do I have any concerns from the people in class today about uh, this well, PHB? One, per one person would like to know um, the crash reduction factor. Was it 55 or 69 percent? And someone else said that and apparently they've used it already. So the biggest issue they had with them was that people didn't understand what to do on the wig wag. And that, uh, the second comment, of course, is going to be quite common if it's new to an area. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, why, what, that's yeah. why they need to have some good PR and like have public education and put it on the news and, yeah, I'm uh, going to um, make sure that comment gets forwarded over to the person said they're trying lots of exclamation points because they've got <laughs> three of them. But I will also forward that information over to Caitlin Harley, who is in our, our ped bike coordinator in the state, because I know that she has a program set up to work on educational pieces that then can be shared with the local municipalities for you guys to utilize. So I'll make sure she's well aware that you know, in order for this to really work, that some great PR marketing would be, um, you know, much needed. So, and yes, Sandy, I'll make sure that she gets that. Um, yes, the, the contact for the PR help, her name is Caitlin Harley. I'll put it in the chat box, but she's going to be on Tuesday's um, webinar, too, to share with you on the second half um, what it is that we're doing in Ohio as far as the application of these treatments. So I don't want to take up too much race time. I know he's got a lot to get through. Thanks, Ray. Sorry. No problem. As far as the crash reduction factor, 
you know, <laughs> I'm only as good as the information I'm given. And he's right. The the first slide says 55%, and this screen here says 69%. Maybe this is this factor here might be specific to this location. Good That's catch on the information, and we'll make sure to get that clarified and out to everybody. But another comment that uh, is typical here is uh, that the flashing red, the wigwag mode, might be confusing to the drivers. And uh, my response to that is, is because they might always be stopped. So it might be confusing, but they react in a safe manner by not moving when the pedestrian has cleared their side of the traveled way. So the PHB is better than a traffic signal in that it allows for vehicular movement once the pedestrian has cleared their side of the roadway while a traffic signal is time for the entire crossing before a green light is given. So that would be the response on that one. So I remember when they installed the one there on Hayden Run, and uh, you know I believe there was some some public education and just you know the advanced warning sign did a lot. Um, but I know they had a real problem there, and then I know maybe I'll have Caitlin speak to that. She's probably familiar with that with that crossing. It's the first one in Columbus. Okay, so let me go back. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so here's an excerpt from the 2009 MUTCD Chapter 4F for pedestrian hybrid beacons. Um, it says the crosswalk stop on red sign shall be used, and there are guidelines for this that are similar to signal warrants. But again, there are guidelines for pedestrian hybrid beacons. And the variables include pedestrian volume, traffic speeds, traffic volumes, and crosswalk length. So you see a red line here, the signal warrant, uh, that's not a part of the actual chart. It was overlaid to show the difference, the number of pedestrians required for a signal just for pedestrians. And so, to get a, an actual traffic signal, you would need more um, pedestrians versus the guidelines for the PHB. And this one here is what you see is a chart for speeds greater than 35. They have another chart for 35 and less. Um, you know, if you have an engineering study for a given site, results in a plotted point above the appropriate curve, then the MUTCD says that a PED hybrid beacon should be considered. <clears throat> and um, that the curves require fewer pedestrians at higher vehicle volumes. And I also note that there's the four different curves here are for different crosswalk length as shown on the graph. So I can point out that any high volume multi-lane four plus lane roadway, the pedestrian volume to warrant a pedestrian beacon is a minimum of 20 pedestrians. And then of course the red line here for the signal warrant is the peak hour pedestrian signal warrant that exceeds 35 miles per hour. And it's up to, you can see a much higher 93 pedestrians. So if we look a little closer at the MUTCD section 4F.01, and the, the standard says, if used, PHB shall be used in conjunction with signs and pavement markings to warn and control traffic. And a PHB shall only be installed at a marked crosswalk. So a PHB is optional for consideration, but if used, must follow the standards set forth in section 4F.01 and should also meet the guidance criteria on when to use it, which includes, if used, pedestrian hybrid beacons, okay, which I just read, shall be used in conjunction with signs and pavement markings. 
at locations where pedestrians enter or cross a street or a highway. And it's also at a marked crosswalk. So those are the MUTCD standards. And here's our 2009 MUTCD mandated sign. So a crosswalk stop on red, the symbolic circular red R10-23 sign, which is in section 2B.53, section two of the MUTCD is all about signs, shall be mounted adjacent to a pedestrian hybrid beacon face on each major street approach. If an overhead pedestrian hybrid beacon face is provided, the sign shall be mounted adjacent to the overhead signal face. Other signs are being considered for use on PHBs since the meaning of the red stop is universally understood. But, but these signs that are considered are not approved yet. So again, more research is going on behind the scenes. <clears throat> so here's an actual picture from the city of Columbus on Hayden Run. So you can see crosswalk, stop on red, proceed on flashing red when clear. Okay, so here we are, with some more info from the 2009 MUTCD, section 4F.02, paragraph four, this is the guidance. It says, when an engineering study finds that installation of a pedestrian hybrid beacon is justified, then the PHB should be installed at least 100 feet from side streets or driveways controlled by stop or yield signs. And again, that's guidance, not a standard. And then, so there's an update to that that says, um, so it's not a standard, it was not a part of the research conducted by TTI that was used to justify the inclusion of the PHB in the 2009 MUTCD. All of the PHBs studied in Tucson, Arizona were at local street intersections because that is where pedestrians typically cross. Placing a PHB at a location where pedestrians do not cross will likely not be used. The NCUTCD unanimously voted to remove the guidance in section 4F.02 at the June 2011 annual meeting for the publication of the next MUTCD. And back then they projected that that would be printed in 2016. Well, here it is, 2020. So a new standard is proposed to read in section E, if a pedestrian hybrid beacon is installed at or immediately adjacent to an intersection with a side road, vehicular traffic on the side road shall be controlled by stop signs. So I guess we'll see when the next MUTCD finally gets here, if that is the actual wording there. So a little more about PHB and intersections. So the guidance is not based on research from Tucson, Arizona, where the PHB Hawk was developed. Hawks and TTI study were at local street intersections. And um, in addition, the guidance that ended up in the final rulemaking was not a part of the preliminary rulemaking that was eventually revised before being adopted into the 2009 MUTCD, thus no one had a chance to review and comment on the final language. And in some states such as Arizona has deleted the guidance that recommended the PHB not be installed at an intersection or driveway controlled by a stop or yield as part of their state supplement. And the ultimate wording in the MUTCD is up to the FHWA, the NCUTCD, is a voluntary advisory committee. However, the FHWA considers all input from the NCUTCD carefully, and it also considers and reviews all comments received from the state and local agencies, as well as members of the public. So still a lot going on with these. 
as far as developing actual standards instead of guidance. Okay, let's take a look at uh, this particular intersection. If used at an intersection or driveway, the PHB crossing and signal equipment should only control one crossing. Okay, so this is from a traffic engineer named Richard Nassi, and he used it in the 2013 ITE Traffic Control Devices Handbook, which he wrote. He said that there will be some stiff, stiff opposition from the National Committee, that's the NCUTCD members, on controlling both sidewalks. It would make it too much like the half signal, which the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the NCUTCD, opposes. So let's see what we got here. So so this controls the one crossing. So let's look at a uh, success story from Florida with the PHBs. Florida Department of Transportation District 7 installed three PHBs along Hillsborough Avenue in the fall of 2015. This is provided by Alex Henry, who is the F. District 7 bike ped safety specialist. They, um, Here's their Hillsborough Avenue preliminary crash data. Average bicycle and pedestrian crashes per year from 2010 through 2015. So if you add those up and divide by six, you get an average of 20 crashes per year. So it was installed in the fall of 2015 and then the statistics came in from the 2016 year and they had they reduced that to seven crashes so do the math that's a 65 percent reduction of all bicycle and pedestrian crashes in the first year of installation and along with the these this installation just like i I mentioned before with these, there was a public education campaign involving uh, billboards and, um, you know, handouts and things on websites. So it was a very robust educational campaign uh, of these educational pamphlets, bus stop and billboard ads, on-street education, and educational presentations to nearby businesses and groups. They also coordinated with their regional transit authority to relocate and consolidate bus stops near the crossings to promote use. So that's what I have with our PHBs. Was there any other comments on those, Victoria? Boy, Ray, we could spend all day on this topic. I think so. So I've got lots of items for you to follow up on after the webinar okay but I know you need to get through so okay happy to do that unless you want to just throw one at me yeah I think I'll let you keep going okay remember there is a, a text sheet involved and some other of these resources to help possibly answer some of the questions so let's move on down our list to road diets. So here's we're talking about road diets. It involves, it's kind of like, it kind of incorporates everything that sometimes it incorporates everything we've looked at so far. Um, again, there's a text sheet down here, bottom right, some information on it. I know me and Victoria, we work at, uh, the High Department of Transportation on West Broad Street. And about 10 years ago, they had a major road diet project in the Hilltop area. 
and uh, I think it's been very successful. People thought, how in the world can we eliminate these through lanes and keep traffic moving? Well, we're going to find out why that's possible here. And believe me, traffic still moves very well. So here's some um, information from the cmfclearinghouse.org. So CMF stands for Crash Modification Factor. CRF is Crash Reduction Factor. And uh, so we're converting four lanes. And what we're focusing on is, you know, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they built a lot of four-lane roadways. Thinking that's, that is so awesome to do that. But it turns out that four-lane roadways can be quite a problem because it doesn't handle left turning vehicles very well. And uh, as soon as somebody stops to make a left turn, there's an instant traffic jam, really. And it causes all kinds of rear end crashes and side swipe crashes and people just left turn crashes in general. So I think everyone should uh, familiarize themselves with this CMF clearinghouse because it's not just about road diets, it's about any of these treatments, even just other treatments like installing a right turn lane at an intersection has a crash modification factor or just a left turn lane or um, you, know, you, you come up with a, a roadway improvement and uh, there's a crash modification or reduction factor tied to it, even pavement markings, for instance. Even specifically with pavement markings, you know, typical white edge line is four inches. Well, if you increase that to six inches wide, there's a, a crash reduction factor associated with that. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, road diets. There's a, a, a good picture of a, a situation that uh, it was a five lane road and now there's only, looks like two through lanes of that uh, at, this mid, at this intersection crossing. So one of the, the really good things about the road diet is when you drop from four or five lanes to three, you, you eliminate the multi-threat crash types that we learned about. So here they've installed a crossing island. And so the pedestrian has two simple steps to get across this multi-lane street. So road diets are great for all modes, but the safety benefits for, for pedestrians are very good. Um, and of course, it will, as I said, it allows for the installation of other treatments like the pedestrian refugee, refuge island we see here, curb extensions if parking is added, and maybe even use an RR, RRFB rather than a PHB. Okay, let's, uh, let's see if uh, the class can uh, zoom in on this uh, before and after picture. And you guys tell me what's the difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. Can you see at least three things differently that are different? See if you can uh, type some stuff in your box for us. One person said bike lanes added. Back in angled parking, um, bike lanes, two-way left turn, road diet reverse angle parking, brighter striping, fewer through lanes, bike lane angled instead of parallel parking, better striping went from five lanes to three, reduced lanes, contrast to pavement markings to pavement. Those are all very good. Improved road marking center turn lane. Yeah, they're, they're just knocking it out of the park here, Ray. Okay, I'm going to say maybe they didn't pick up on one that is very important. Now, full disclosure, I didn't read all of them, so maybe somebody did. 
All right, let's see what else I, I can pick up here. Okay, so it's always, I always like to ask what's different about the before and after. So from the responses, I see most people get that uh, there is a reduced number of lanes and there is added bike lanes. I even heard the back in angled parking. That was a really good pickup on that one. I'm going to give that person an A for the day. But there's one that I did not hear. And that is the fact that in the picture on the right, there is brand new pavement. And so the point is, is that if agencies stay ahead of their resurfacing program by a year or two, they can plan and go through the various stages of project development like public involvement and get the road diet done for very low cost because you're getting it done as part of the resurfacing project. A little bit more about the angled back end angled parking, you know, there are pros and cons to that. So the a pro is that the doors open up and block the kids from going towards the street. And when you pull out, you can have a better picture of seeing the vehicles and bicyclists. You actually gain additional parking spaces, which the businesses love. You can load items into your trunk from the sidewalk rather than back towards the road. And there are some cons, like if someone sits there idling their car, the exhaust fumes are not welcome near outdoor cafes. Um, the back end of some vehicles can be longer than the front, so people need to be aware of uh, that they might run into parking meters or other fixed object placements and another thing of course is some people just can't back in park like those that we know can't even parallel park so those are the pros and cons so so to find out more information on the road diet we've got some really good publications here from FHWA safety program. We have the road diet informational guide. We have the link there on the screen to that. We also have a from the US DOT and FHWA, the road diet case studies. Um, and it's got the link there as well for more information. Let's take a look here at a road diet project in New Jersey and uh, a really good video. It's in my, I'm hoping everybody can hear it, but if not, you can at least see it. Um, this is good enough to show at a public meeting. So take note that there is a link to it at the bottom of the screen. It's actually about 15 minutes long. I probably don't have 15 minutes to spare today, but at least I'll. No, you don't. I know, but should I just skip it? You have 15 minutes left today, Ray. So okay. probably, why don't we just send them a link to it and they can watch it on their own time. Okay. Yeah, again, it, the link's at the bottom of the screen, but if you need us to send you a link, we can Instead, do you want to take a question real quick? Okay. A pretty good one that just came in. How do trailing vehicles know the lead vehicle intends to back up from the through lane into the angled parking space? Wouldn't rear and crashes be a concern as well as traffic stopping while a vehicle backs from the through lane? Yeah, that's a good point. I thought of that myself. Um, you know, what can a person do? They're going to be tapping their brake lights, maybe, maybe putting on their flashers, sticking their Another hand person. out the window and waving. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody else just chimed in and said it works just like parallel parking. So you're right. What's like the that? difference? Now that you think about it, you got to do the same thing with that if you do it correctly. Yeah. Good point. But they've used it for 14 years in Canton without an issue. Wow. I remember when I was at the, working for the city of Columbus, you know, they had angled parking on Gay Street, but it was head in. So they probably had more of a problem with that and people backing out in front of people. 
maybe the person from Canton can put some um, additional comments and two more questions that came in about wanting to know how it affects their operations in Canton, especially during peak times. But lots of other folks are saying turn signals, people. Use turn signals. So Turn signals, what? They still exist? <laughs> All right, Ray. All right, let's move on. So there's some general guidelines at uh, different levels of traffic volumes. For anywhere from less than 10,000 ADT, 10 to 15 ADT, 15 to 20, and greater than 20. So as you can see, they're all candidates, but they range from great, from the lower volume, to very good, then good, and then greater than 20,000 is a potential candidate for a road diet. West Broad Street and Hilltop, if I had to guess, it was probably in the range of 10 to 15, if I had to guess. And that turned out really good. So, um, Quick answer to that question I put out there for Canton in response to those other questions about peak times. Canton said that they're using that on their roads that are under capacity, so it worked well. They don't have it on their busiest streets. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so there are some uh, considerations on each one of these levels of traffic volumes. So if we look at 10 to 15, for instance, says agencies should conduct intersection analysis to study potential traffic operational effects and consider signal retiming as needed. So yeah, there's some engineering studies need to be done for such a project. Agencies at the between 15 to 20 range should conduct a corridor analysis since traffic operations may be affected at this volume depending on the before condition. And then once you get above 20,000, says agencies should complete a feasibility study to determine whether or not that's a good location for a road diet. Operations may be affected at this volume. So it definitely takes some planning involved. So that's why, you know, the in the first slide we talked about staying, if you're two years ahead of a a resurfacing project that might give you enough time to, to incorporate such a project. All right, so here's uh, three locations that uh, implemented some roadway, some road diet projects from Pasadena to Lansing, Michigan to Seattle. And uh, so Pasadena had uh, 15,000, Lansing had 18,000, and Seattle 25,000. And uh, this is directly from the road diet guide. And uh, so considerations from safety, peak hour operations, design, signalized intersection adjustments, resurfacing, and context sensitive solutions for and involving you know ideas from the complete streets uh, initiative. So in the next few slides, we'll talk about these. So here's a four-lane roadway. A lot of four-lane roadways already operate like a three-lane road. Um, de facto, one lane in each direction. I mean, think about it. If you're in a four-lane road enough, you know that if you're not going to turn left, you, you want to be in the far right lane because you could get stuck behind a left turner and nobody likes to do that. So when a corridor contains a large number of access points, like driveways, the majority of through traffic will tend to utilize the outside lanes to avoid being delayed by left turning vehicles, slowing and stopping in the inside lanes. You know, when I worked, lived in Dublin, but worked downtown and I'd use Riverside Drive and you learn that lesson very quickly to if you're going the long haul from Dublin to downtown, you stay out of the the left lane, the left through lane. So 
So if uh, in your road diet project, of course, you want to look at intersections. If you've got a traffic signal, then you have to, you're going to have to be studying signal timing or phasing changes to optimize op operations and safety benefits. Um, a lot of times, like in New Jersey, they took out the traffic signals and installed roundabouts, which is feasible if, you have, if you're less than 20,000 ADT. So the single lane roundabouts in the traditional four to three road diet work well in combination with each other. So let's get into our jets and fly out to San Diego here for this next one. La Jolla Boulevard, which is in the Bird Rock community. Let's see here. Make sure I'm on the right. All right, so here's a picture. It's got a five lane roadway, two in each direction, two way left turn lane, and on street parking on the right side of the picture. And uh, they had around 20,000 vehicles a day with an average speed of, you know, they went out and studied it. This is prior to 2003, 38 to 42 miles per hour. The roadway configuration and speed of traffic created a, a setting which was uninviting for pedestrians and unable to stimulate growth among local businesses. In response to numerous community members demanding a safer walking environment, the city of San Diego in partnership with the community embarked upon a project to improve safety along this boulevard. So we're gonna take a look at the benefits of a traditional road diet with a single lane roundabout. So here's an after picture. Let's take a look at the before. There's the before. There's some after pictures. So we see a median. We've added bike lanes. We've got curb extensions up here. Marked crosswalk. That's from Street View and Google Maps. So here we have our aerial view. And it's showing our roundabouts on the left and right side of the picture and our raised median in here. So we have improvement included narrower travel lanes. I actually had five roundabouts, landscaped medians, and angled parking. And that slowed the traffic speeds and improved pedestrian safety and also revitalized the businesses. So what a great project. Hate to say it, Ray, five minutes left. I got this. Remember, I only wanted to go to 180. I know. I just wanted to mention it. We're cooking with gas now. Okay, so um, road diets was the last treatment under the guide for improving pedestrian safety at uncontrolled crossing locations. So before we get into the leading pedestrian interval, the LPI, there are a few slides to briefly go into of this, uh, this guide here, the guide for improving pedestrian safety at uncontrolled crossing locations. So this is the published by FHWA and provides guidance and suggested processes for selecting countermeasures that walks you through the, this process uh, for improving safety at uncontrolled crossing locations and assists the agencies in developing a policy to support the installation of countermeasures at uncontrolled crossing locations. And you can view this book for free at this link at the bottom of the screen uh, on the FHWA's Innovation and Everyday Counts website.
So it gives you a countermeasure selection process, which involves six steps that I uh, just wanted to quickly discuss. So the first step is collect data and engage the public. And so in that process, there's these uh, bullet points here, collect pedestrian crash and safety data, evaluate pedestrian accommodation policies, initiate a pedestrian safety action plan, review pedestrian and traffic safety plans, and conduct a walkability audit. So a careful review of existing plans and policies such as these will help prepare for more in-depth data analysis and public involvement. So we want uh, the class to be sure and check out the updated FHWA guide. This was actually released in 2017, how to develop a pedestrian and bicycle safety action plan. So um, that is a, a good guide, the latest and greatest to help you through this process. So what my plan is then, this is where we're going to pick up on Tuesday, uh, go through, we'll finish these six steps and then get into the signalized uh, intersection treatments. And then when I'm done with those, then we'll have Caitlin Harley um, take my place and uh, she'll talk about some Columbus specific treatments. Right, Victoria? I don't think anybody can ever take your place, Ray, but yes, not ah. Columbus specific, but Ohio specific. Oh, you know, Ohio how we implemented, specific. yeah, I, the program that is the Ped Bike Coordinator, she is working on to implement these types of treatments across Ohio. So I, I hope she never hears the part about taking your place because she'll shake her head too. Nobody can oh. ever take your place, Ray. Oh, please. <laughs> But so I can't believe we actually got to slide 180. So I didn't think you it was know, possible. You did a great job. And I do have a number of questions for you to respond okay. to. And yeah. just so you know, I've committed you to providing a comprehensive question and answer document once the whole series is done. So all these questions that have come in and the research you're doing, we'll put that together in a comprehensive document, get it out to you. But it is going to take us a little time. So please give Ray a little bit of time after the last session next week. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up for today. Again, um, Tuesday will be part four, and we definitely appreciate you being on here. We are so excited about your commitment to pedestrian safety in Ohio because we know that, you know, our younger generations especially are much more driven to use other modes of transportation than just a car. So thank you for all the work you're doing every day to keep people safe in Ohio. And you stay safe as well, and we will see you guys on Tuesday. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.